Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, which is sponsored by USDA NIFA through the North Central IPM Center. My name is Will Fulwider. I'm the project manager here at the Organic and IPM Working Group, and will be hosting the webinar this afternoon. I'm also pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Lane Selman, who will be speaking about her work with the Culinary Breeding Network. Since 2005, Lane has been an agricultural researcher at Oregon State University, working with diversified organic farmers on collaborative research projects. In 2012, Lane created the Culinary Breeding Network in order to build a community of plant breeders, seed growers, farmers, produce buyers, chefs, and other stakeholders to improve quality in vegetables and grains while breeding for organic production. Lane has a bachelor's in, ag in agronomy and a master's in entomology from the University of Florida. She currently lives in Portland, Oregon, where she also serves on the Portland Farmers Market Board. Before we get on with the webinar and have Lane speak and present her work with the Culinary Breeding Network to us, just go through some logistics first. This webinar is being recorded and will be available later on our website, organicipmworkinggroup.wordpress.com. By attending today's web webinar, you're eligible for one CCA uh, continue education credits in crop management. Also, if you have any questions for the presenter, feel free to use the question boxes at any time. Um, Lane has said that she likes to field the questions as her, she presents, and we'll keep an eye on that question box. Um, and if not, uh, we can wait till the end of the presentation, and I will moderate those questions and pose them to Lane at the end. You will receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the webinar recording if you're not watching live. If you are watching live and, and not, you will receive a evaluation on the webinar as well as to sub a link to submit your CCA credentials to earn that continue education unit. And these credits might take a couple of weeks to show up in your account, so please have some patience in that. If anything goes wrong with those education credits, feel free to email me at wfullwider at ipminstitute.org, and my email will be on a slide at the end of the presentation. Logistics aside, I will go over a brief announcement about an upcoming webinar. We have, for this last calendar year, uh, we have December webinar with Dr. Gladys Zanatti of the Rodale Institute. Um, she will be presenting on her research as the director of the Vegetable Systems Trial um, on her work with flowery insectary, insectary plants, AIDS, as biological control of the striped cucumber beetle. That will be on December 12th from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. Central Time link uh, to register uh, is, is there and then will be sent out uh, through the working group and also newsletters that from which you heard about this presentation, this webinar. February, there will be an also our final webinar uh, of, the, of this project uh, that is yet to be announced. Uh, we will post about the presenter and the topic in the coming weeks. With that, I will push the presentation over to Lane and she will begin talking about her work with the Culinary Breeding Network. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, let me see, I'll put this one up there. Let me squeeze this. If I, and you can see my screen now, Cody? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> We can hear, we can see and hear you. We're we are good okay. to go. If I pop out that control panel, do you see that? You don't, right? No. Okay, great. I will try to um, take a. Um, I'll try to take a look at questions as they come up. But if I don't see them, you can just let me know. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, so as Will said, I um, I'm Lane Selman. Um, I work at uh, Oregon State University. And today I'm gonna to talk to you guys about a project that I started, a program called um, the Culinary Breeding Network. Um, so I'll just uh, briefly kind of go over like how I got to doing that and, um, and then what the network is all about. Oops. 
hold on, it's not advancing. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so um, when I started working for Oregon State University uh, in 2005, uh, I was hired full time to work on one project. So I'm all grant funded. Um, to let you guys know, but um, and that was the only, the first and only time I was ever working on just one project. <laughs> ever since then, I've had to work on <clears throat> many different projects um, to to make a job. But I I worked on just this one project, and it was just with potatoes. And since this is an IPM um, group, I will also mention that um, uh, my background is I came from the I came from Florida. I grew up on a, a citrus farm. I went to University of Florida and studied agronomy. Um, as Will said, and then I went to get a master's degree in entomology, and I specifically worked um, in um, potatoes and cotton and um, looking at integrated pest management systems for those crops. So I was kind of, I took a break from agriculture and working forestry for a little bit, and then I came back and was hired to do this. So I was excited to work with um, potatoes again. Um, in Florida, I worked with potatoes that were used for the chipping market and these are fresh market potatoes. Um, so the project we affectionately called OSPUD, it was a SARE funded project. Um, it was a two year project and it was um, multidisciplinary in that if you check out all the people that are sitting here on this photo, these are all farmers and researchers from Oregon and, um, and Washington. And so we have in the group, a plant pathologist and an entomologist and a, um, nutrition specialist. Um, so we, what we specifically were looking at in this project was problems that organic farmers uh, were having with their potato production. So the farmers in this picture and in this, and these are just some of the farmers we worked with, we worked with about 20 different farmers on this project. We, those farmers were direct marketing fresh potatoes and they grew a lot of different crops. So anywhere from, you know, 20 to 40 different crops that were probably growing. Um, and the scale was anything from like an acre to 60 acres. Um, but really the key point I'm trying to make, I guess, is that they grow a lot of different things, not just potatoes. Uh, they're organic farmers and they're selling for the fresh market. And most of them were at least part of their business was direct sales through farmers markets, um, CSA, directly to restaurants. And some of them did do wholesale, but um, only some of them did wholesale. Um, so they had a lot of access to their consumers and they understood what their consumers wanted. Um, so we were specifically looking at a lot of different problems that they were having, insect disease, nutrient man management questions. Um, and we, we were looking at uh, late blight, which most of you probably know, um, but was caused the potato famine in Ireland in the 1800s. It's still um, a big problem here in the Pacific Northwest. We have a very conducive environment to that pathogen. And so they were having a lot of problems with um, their potatoes. Um, and we worked a lot on cultural methods the first year for that specific um, part of the project. Um, and then, we decided we would do some um, variety trials to try to see if we could find just naturally resistant varieties. And we planted a lot of different things. Um, and also one thing that's unique about this project is that it's very participatory. So the, the farmers were extremely engaged in it and we had meetings like a kind of retreat meetings in the winter time. So we had three of those during the part of this, uh, during this two year project at the very beginning you know, right after the first field season. And then the final one was after the second field season. Um, so we um, were at the second meeting and we um, were talking about planning our uh, variety trials. And we decided to have a couple of different, um, they're not at OSU anymore, but OSU potato breeders uh, come and join us. So they joined us and um, we told them some of the issues that the farmers were having, and then the the, re, uh, the breeder said, oh, well, you know, we have tons of different varieties um, of, you know, we have lots of germplasm that's in our system that has resistance, and we actually have a couple of varieties that are being released that maybe you want to grow because they have, a, you know, they have quite a bit of resistance um, to late blight and we got very excited and some of the farmers asked, started asking all the questions that get unleashed whenever um, <laughs> there's someone talks about a, a new variety and they want to know all about it and they want to know the spacing and 
how a lot of the, the production questions that they had, but then one of them said, so what's it taste like? And one of the researchers said without missing a beat, oh, well, it tastes terrible. Um, so we're doing a webinar right now, so I don't know what your reaction is to that, but most people's reaction when I tell this story, uh, when I'm doing a presentation, everyone laughs, right? because it's kind of like, well, what's like, how useful is that, a potato that doesn't taste good? Um, and so as we started discussing with them more, it was very obvious that they were not really looking for flavor. Um, they were looking for a lot of different attributes and traits that these potatoes would have because they were for the French fry market. So flavor isn't um, a big concern because you're going to be frying them, you're going to be putting salt on them. Um, and so the focus is not so much on flavor. Um, so that's when we kind of said, wow, like, well, who are the breeders um, that are looking at what, what we need as organic farmers for one, um, but also for fresh market farmers. So that was um, this, you know, there's a lot more to say about OSPUD, but just for now, that's all that um, I wanted to say, but it led into some other um, projects um, like Novic, which maybe some of you have heard of, which is the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. This is an OREI funded project. And we're actually in our third um, funding cycle of this project. Um, so we're in our ninth field season. We just finished it, uh, we'll be going into our 10th. Um, so it's been pretty incredible. This is um, a project that is led by Oregon State University, but also involves Organic Seed Alliance up in Washington, but they, are, uh, they work nationally. University of Wisconsin at Madison and Cornell University. And also it's not on here, but our last um, funding cycle, we also included Colorado State. So we have, um, we have breeders at each of those institutions that does breeding of different vegetables with a focus on organic systems. Um, so this last slide that you saw was all market, like production farmers, they're growing produce for their market. Here we see, um, in this group, we see a mixture of those same produce growers, as well as seed growers and plant breeders. So we have some regional seed companies here, we have some national seed companies, and then the fellow that's over here at the mustache and the, on the right-hand side is Jim Myers, who is um, the vegetable breeder at Oregon State University. Um, so like I said, at each of these institutions, there's a lead breeder that's breeding for us, um, a, a vegetable that we have in this project. There's six vegetables involved in this project. Um, sweet corn, tomatoes, peppers, cabbage, um, carrots, and then we have a farmer's choice. So, um, and that's left up to each region. I'll get to that in a moment. So what we do for each of these crops is we grow out. So this, this picture over here on the bottom left-hand side is our cabbage. And so we grow out different varieties of cabbage on those at the far, farms at those institutions as well as on um, actual farmers, uh, organic farmers um, farms. So it's a mother-daughter design where we have the mother is the institution's farm and then the daughters are, and we do uh, replicate it three times and then we choose th at least three um, daughter farms in that area in which we grow out one rep of each of the the trials and the trials include varieties that we know perform well in organic systems, new varieties that we want to test out to see how they perform, and then breeding lines from the different breeders that are involved at these institutions, as well as if there are any breed local independent breeders or seed companies that would like to have entry, um, those are in there. So we try to keep it limited to nine varieties and breeding lines per crop. Um, it's a lot of work to keep it to that to that size because we always want to add more uh, entries. But this is once again a very participatory project, and we have annual meetings in the winter time. That's when these pictures are taken. Actually, we've gathered together for one of those retreats and made the decisions together. Um, so we grow those all out. They actually determine the evaluation criteria that they want us to evaluate for, um, and then we evaluate them in the field. And so we've been doing that for many years. Like I said, we just finished our ninth season. Um, and there's a focus to each one of the, um, the crops where if we are, let's say for instance, the tomatoes, we're looking for um, a red slicer that's indeterminate, that is resistant to particular diseases. Um, and so with that one, it's late white resistance. 
Um, we've done, we've worked with broccoli in the past and the focus was, um, you know, it's always the variety, we're trying to find the varieties that perform well for organic farmers that is produced organically so that they have more options for organic seed. But there's a, you typically a season extension focus on this as well. So with the broccoli, it was heat tolerance. So we were growing broccoli um, that we would be harvesting in the summertime to see which ones perform the best. Um, so in this project, oh, well, so I, sorry, I forgot this slide was in here. So, um, and the reason I said that we're focused on organic systems is because um, the needs of the organic farmers can be um, different from conventional farmers. I mean, we all want disease resistance and we all want things that don't, that compete well with weeds, but for organic farmers, it's a particular interest because they're not utilizing chemicals. Um, so when you open up a seed catalog, um, there are less options for organic farmers. Um, and there's also a lot of confusion whether or not a variety is going to perform well for them in their organic system or not. Um, and this is a very updated, um, just this, this past year, um, version of this um, seed industry structure that shows um, seed company consolidation. Um, uh, due to this and um, typically larger companies buying smaller companies, um, a lot of varieties are lost. They are dropped um, from production. Um, those might be varieties that are, um, the organic farmers are dependent upon. This happens quite a bit, um, we hear in our meetings, um, as well as um, as this, this, this schematic is showing, a lot of the seed companies are being purchased by chemical companies. Um, so the same companies that produce uh, herbicides and uh, pesticides are also doing the breeding work and might not um, have the same focus on wanting to breed for organic systems. So this is basically um, a concern for a lot of the farmers that we're working with uh, and also limits their, their options for what was going to perform best in organic systems. Um, and these are, this is just a little schematic that um, I made up about the values of the individuals that are involved in this, um, these projects and in the Culinary Breeding Network, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and what they are looking for um, in their food and in their varieties that they're wanting to plant. So a lot of them are interested in preserving heirlooms. They're interested in cultural, they have cultural values, um, higher nutrition. Um, they wanna make sure that they're using varieties that have been, um, they have been created using traditional breeding techniques. Um, a lot of focus on resilience. Um, and so having varieties that are going to be very resilient in the face of um, insect pressure, uh, disease, um, lower input systems. Um, so, and, and, and in the middle I put here is clim climate chaos because it is what we are up against. And so wanting to have resilient varieties that can do well when we're um, experiencing a lot of uh, fluctuations in our climate and our weather. So as I said, there's a, um, we work with five like fixed crops um, and, but then we also allow for a farmer's choice. So in each of those four, four regions, we allow the farmers to decide what variety trial, what crop they want us to, to you know, to organize a variety trial for. Um, and so this is when we did not have peppers as one of our, so in the, and this is the third um, time we've had funding, like I said, and so there's been a little bit of shift in the crops. And so in the first um, Novik, um, the, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little ding in my computer. I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of that. Um, but uh, um, so in the first rendition of the, the project, we did not have peppers. So um, our farmers got together and we talked about what do we want the farmer's choice crop to be. And um, someone mentioned peppers. And she actually said that she really wanted to work on peppers because there was a variety that she really liked and that she grew every year called Gypsy, um, which was a hybrid that um, she could no longer find enough seed for. And she wanted, she basically wanted Gypsy, but she said, is there anything else out there that is like Gypsy? Can we find something like it? Because I'm not able to get enough seed of this uh, favorite pepper anymore. And then someone else chimed in and said, um, well, you know, I actually, I was growing Gypsy uh, last season and I noticed a lot of off types. So meaning like a lot of uh, plants or fruits that did not look like 
the gypsy plant or fruit should. Um, and this is the power actually of bringing all these, these individuals into the room together. Like the farmers oftentimes do not have um, very much knowledge of what happens in the seed world. Um, so the seed people in the room said, well, actually, if you're not able to find enough, you know, um, of the seed, and, and also you're finding off types, then that means that that company is likely um, going to drop that variety and not offer it anymore, right? And like the, like we looked at that schematic where it shows, you know, companies buying other companies, and then they have a profile of a lot of sweet peppers let's say they're not going to continue to produce all of those um they're going to limit the, you know they're gonna uh limit the what they what they have to offer because they don't need that many and it could likely be and like in this case it could likely be a variety that organic farmers are very dependent upon so everyone um in the group pretty much was growing gypsy they really liked it um and so they said why don't we try to find a variety that is basically just like gypsy, but something different. And then someone else said, well, since it is a hybrid and hybrids tend to go, you know, get dropped and we cannot reproduce a hybrid then. Um, all of you probably know that you cannot save the seed of the hybrid and plant it and expect to get the same thing as you started with. Uh, the genetics of those um, parent lines then start to express themselves and you start to see different traits. Um, so they said, why don't we try to find an open pollinated? Um, so when we looked at what's available for us to try to, you know, to trial, um, we looked at Frank Morton and um, this is, um, so years before this, like I said, we're trying to get, you know, we're trying to replace, find a good replacement for Gypsy. Um, and Frank Morton has wild garden seed and he's here in Oregon and he had actually, um, he's very well known for lettuce and kale and mostly, uh, mostly leafy greens. Um, but he had gotten involved in this pepper, um, project, um, when a woman named Jolene, who is managing gathering together farm, which he had a business relationship with, um, had come to him about five years before this and said, Frank, um, I love this pepper called La Paris. Um, it's a hybrid. I can no longer get the seed untreated. I cannot find it available anywhere untreated. So um, I'm not sure if everyone knows or not, but um, uh, so there's, if you are wanting to get organic certification, um, you do not have to use organic seed. Um, they want you to try to find organic seed. If you cannot find it, you document it, um, that you've looked for something, uh, a particular variety in three places. If you don't find it organically, you can buy it conventionally. Um, but you cannot use treated seed ever because it actually has an insect, I mean, I'm sorry, a pesticide on it. So in this case, a fungicide on it. So she said, I'm not able to find it anymore, but I love it. Could you possibly uh, create a pepper like La Paris for me. Um, she had some seed left over in her package. She gave it to Frank and Frank said, please explain to me what it is you want. And she essentially described the traits of La Paris and that's what's up here at the top, right? And he's, you know, she said, I want a um, elongated sweet pepper that's crumpled, has tapered at the bottom, has thick walls, thin skin, that type of thing, right? Um, so, um, Frank took that seed, which is the La Paris seed. He planted it. So that is the F1. That's the hybrid. It is the, um, you know, it is the crop that, you know, the pepper that, that Jolene wanted. And then he saved that seed and planted it the next year and was very shocked to see a lot of different phenotypes in the F2 generation. So he saw um, a lot of these types of shapes and sizes, right? He saw golden peppers and red peppers and ones that were more like bell shaped and ones that had straight walls and crumply walls. And so he said, oh my God, you know, this is a huge project and undertaking now. Um, and so this is, he basically just segregated them, right? Um, so he took this hybrid and just kept growing it out and growing it out and separating, you know, trying to keep separate all the different types until he then created, um, a lot of different varieties. I think he's created like 
you know, um, maybe eight different varieties from this one, which started with this one hybrid. Um, at the time of this trial, he did not have the stocky golden roaster, but he had these other four. Um, so we included those in the trial. This Jolene's Rustic Italian, he named for Jolene because it's basically what she was wanting. It was the one that was like La Prairie. Um, so these we all put in the trial. And they were absolutely fantastic. They were absolutely amazing. It was my job to go out on the farms to look at them. And so we look at them on lots of different farms. So then we know that it is the genetics that actually is causing them to perform in the way that they do and not the environment. So we're trying to tease out that, that um, variable and look at it in a lot of different environments. I was very, very impressed um, and really excited about it. But the one thing that we were not doing at all in these um, is, you know, in these evaluations where we were not tasting them. Um, so I decided that I wanted to do a tasting. And instead of just me just tasting them and giving, you know, normally we would rate everything, whether it's um, leaf canopy or, um, you know, uh, lodging or, or whatever that is that, that what we're trying to evaluate for, we evaluate on a one to nine or one to five scale. And so normally it would be just me out there in the field taking a bite of this pepper and giving it a one to five or a one to nine, which I just didn't feel like was enough. And I did. I felt like I was only one human being and um, we should have more people tasting them. Um, and I also knew I was going to be biased because I was so impressed with the plants of Frank's. So um, I also worked at the farmer's market and knew a lot of chefs at that point in time. And I asked them to convene and see if they wanted to taste peppers with me. And so um, they all said yes. We did it on a Monday because that's typically their day off during the day and got together and this is how we did the tasting. Um, I can I discussed this before I set it up with some sensory scientists and this is how we set it up. So this is Gypsy. It actually, the variety name you do not see, it's turned over and there was a code, um, but you could flip it over when you wanted to see what the variety was when the tasting was all done. But they got to see the um, the pepper whole, as also halved, um, and then they tasted in raw and sauteed and roasted. Um, because not everyone's going to eat peppers raw and maybe something that doesn't taste that great raw is going to taste fantastic roasted. Or you might love, really love it raw, but maybe the skins don't come off very easily and it's not very useful to us roasted because when you roast peppers, you want to be able to peel that skin off. Um, so I did, you know, what as I'm supposed to do as a researcher where I create a ballot and I set this up as a one to nine. I have them evaluate on all these different parameters appearance, flavor, sweetness, texture, overall rating. Now we had nine varieties. So here this, this is only five. So this is something not to do. This is my, <laughs> this is like the second tasting I ever did because I had done some with, um, uh, with, with potatoes, but this is the first I'd ever done with the peppers. So this is the way not to do it because this is way too much to ask of someone to do. Um, these are chefs um, that I had at this tasting and they are um, not the same kind of people as we are. They are able to, um, they, their palates don't blow out as quickly as ours. And so they are actually able to get through um, more, taste more things, but this is quite a bit to ask them for, to do. Um, so anyway, they tasted all of these. We did it the proper way. We didn't talk during it. Uh, that we got the one to nine. And the idea is I put this into the statistics program and spit out the answer, right? Well, not so not so easy. Because what happens is, I this is when I always tell everyone, like, I'm not the best scientist, right? Because what I really like to do is just talk to people. And so after this, when we were all done, and ballots were turned in, um, somebody opened up a bottle of Prosecco, we stayed, this was at a restaurant, we, um, we stayed and just talked. And so when we talked, what I found out was, the big thing for them, when they taste, when all of them tasted pretty good, like there were some that didn't taste great, right? And so they said, well, we don't want those. But the ones that then tasted all pretty similar or, you know, as well as level of acceptance, you know, as acceptance um, for uh, flavor, what really um, was the thing that made them want the pepper was this one, um, was what I'll show you right here. So these both are those, so that dehybridization that Frank Morton did, this was one of them on the left, a stocky red roaster, and then the right is Jolene's, right? And so what really pushed the chefs overboard 
to say like, this is the pepper that I actually want. When both Lisa he, he thought tasted great was the stocky red roaster because when they looked at it, they saw um, a product that would cook e uh, even more even um, and also a product that could, would have less waste in the kitchen and also efficiency in the kitchen. And it seems very, very obvious to talk about this at this point, but back then it really wasn't that obvious to me. It wasn't what I was thinking of because I think about different things. So the rounded shoulders here um, and the very straight walls, obviously the straight walls are gonna have it cook um, much more evenly. Um, and then this, these rounded shoulders make it so that you can just cut that, that stem off without much waste um, and just crank through it when you have hundreds and hundreds of these things to, to cut up where the other one on the right hand side, Jolene's, even though that is the pepper that Jolene actually asked for and wanted and oftentimes does sell very nicely in a farmer's market for customers that are buying two of them for dinner rather than cranking through hundreds of them in a commercial kitchen might want that one. Um, but that was something that I was very intrigued with and I thought, my goodness, I really, really should have these chefs talking to the breeders because I don't know if the breeders are actually thinking about these traits. Um, and that's when we started, um, so this is when the, uh, we start getting into the, the culinary breeding network and how it came about. So um, one thing before that is to that point, this is Frank Morton and Frank is, as I said, Wild Garden Seed. He's the guy who created the peppers and he's known for lettuce and here he is with his lettuce field. This is all lettuce that's gone to seed. Um, and on the right hand side, this is one of his breeding plots. So these are all siblings. He takes two parents, crosses them, um, grows them out, takes a look at all the progeny, and he decides which ones to move forward with or not. So the, the point of this slide is Frank is standing out there in his field alone. Frank is an extremely good, fantastic breeder. He knows what he's doing. Um, he knows what to select for, but he is all by himself. So he does this work by himself or with you know, the four crew members that he has at times, but normally he's doing all of his breeding work alone. So not very many opinions. And is it what everyone wants? Um, there's a lot of different stakeholders out there. Um, so the next time around when we had, our, we repeated our sweet pepper um, tasting, but this next time we brought them an active breeding project. So not released varieties, but actually a project that was in process with Jim Myers, the, the, um, the head of Novik that you saw in that photo um, a couple slides ago. So he was working on a low heat habanero um, and he was specifically trying to find, uh, you know, creative variety that was early because they're tropical peppers are very late season and hard to, um, to grow here in Oregon. So he was looking for, he's selecting for earliness and he was also selecting for plant architecture because a lot of those um, tropical peppers tend to split or to lodge. And so um, he was selecting against those things, right? So, but in his breeding population of plants, he had all these different phenotypes, right? So um, here on the left-hand side, there's all these different shapes, sizes, colors, and flavors. And he just had no idea what to select for. So essentially we set up a selection event for, um, it was chefs and farmers uh, and farmers market uh, management. They all got together and tasted them. We tasted them raw and we tasted them sauteed. They did not roast very well. So we did them two ways and people got to look at them and they actually, this was actually a selection event because from that information, Jim decided which phenotype, which you know shape, size, color uh, and and um, if they tasted them for, you know, for flavor as well, um, that in, people would be drawn to. Uh, and they actually chose something that's kind of in between on the bottom left and the bottom right, this red, um, slightly crumply um, um, shape is what people were most uh, interested in. So that kind of became uh, the first, I would say, gathering of the Culinary Breeding Network because it did invite other individuals to be part of the plant breeding process. Um, and at this point, the way that I look at the, um, the Culinary Breeding Network is that it's building communities of plant breeders, seed growers, farmers, produce buyers, chefs, and other stakeholders to improve quality in vegetables and grains. 
I could say fruit too, because I would love to do that, but I just have not worked with fruit at this um, point. Well, except botanically, a lot of things are fruits, but you know what I mean. Um, so that's really what the Culinary Breeding Network is trying to do. It started with these tastings like this and showing people, uh, stakeholders, uh, what we're looking on, you know, for in breeding. Um, and then it's moved on from there to other types of engagement, which I'm going to go through some slides like that. Um, but the very first um, really big event where I was like, how are we going to get a lot of different individuals, not just 30 chefs um, involved in this, but how are we going to get, convene, you know, hundreds of people to see what plant breeders actually do and to be part of the plant breeding process. And so I started doing these um, events called the Variety Showcase. Um, and at this point, I have done four of these in Portland, Oregon. Um, one a year from 2014 to 2017. And then in 2018, I did one in Hawaii um, and then one in New York City. I'm doing one in Hawaii in a couple of weeks and then also one in um, Portland in February that is going to focus on uh, winter vegetables. Um, but essentially this is, um, as you can read here, it's an interact. So that thing I'm really trying to do is get um, to create outreach events that are fun and very engaging um, and presented in a manner more like um, a food event or something where we will be able to um, attract people in the public that normally would not come to say a workshop or a field day. Um, so we invite them to come and taste new varieties in development varieties. Um, and so basically each of those is a series of tables, typically anywhere depending on the space that we're in between 15 and 35 different tables um, that have plant breeders showing what they, what type of breeding projects they're working on paired with a chef who then makes a dish for people to sample. Um, so this is in 2017. Up here, there's all this, these individuals up here in the top right hand side, these are all just the participating um, chefs, farmers, plant breeders, researchers. Um, we had 540 people from the public come to the event. Um, there are 30 of those breeder chef tables with some special ex exhibit rooms. Um, it was pretty exciting. Um, this happened in downtown Portland. Um, so if, for an example, you would go to a table and maybe this one is um, the beet breeder. Um, there's a beet breeder that works on breeding for um, flavor in beets. So every single table, there's a, they, the, the breeder has to have a focus on breeding for organic systems and considers flavor in their process. And so um, this one was a plant breeder who um, works on geosmin levels in beets and that's the earth, that's um, the chemical that um, creates an earthy flavor in beets and one is to see how what people think about that flavor and so they taste things side by side you get to look and taste at things sometimes they have those types of ballots sometimes it's just really to interact with the breeder so a lot of these pictures are just showing like what the tables look like these are paprika peppers these are seed that comes from uh, Hungary which a chef had brought back for a farmer and they're growing out many different um, um, lines of those to see which ones the chefs like the best. Um, this is Frank Morton with some parsley. This is, um, he got 14 different accessions of parsley from the, the USDA um, seed bank uh, from 10 different countries. They tasted very different from one another, grew them all out, tasted them side by side, and the chef here made a granita with them. Um, this is a um, carrot breeding project with Organic Seed Alliance and Phil Simon from USDA. I'm going to go through these, these quickly because I have quite a few more to go through. This is showing, and these are unreleased breeding lines. And so they're breeding for organic systems. They get to talk to the individuals about that, talk about what that means, and then ask people what they think about the appearance and the flavor of these different lines. Um, here's Jim Myers. He works on a lot of different vegetables, the mild habaneros, as you know, and then some tromboncino squash, which people get really excited about. People love things that are new and interesting that they are that something that they haven't seen before or something that has a story to them. So um, it's, it's a lot of fun. As you can see, they're not faking the fun. They're, they're having a good time. It's really nice, engaging event. 
um, cilantro. I mean, I had so many people come up to me after this and say, oh my God, I thought there was one cilantro. So it's pretty exciting to get to explain to people how much diversity there actually is within a, a species. Fennel, this, is a, this was one of the farmer's choice um, projects, I'm sorry, crops in our uh, Novik project. Um, and so people got to taste, but these fennels taste very different from um, one to the other. Um, some of them are very anisey and some of them are quite mild. Uh, and watery. Um, we also like to really try to um, to highlight any of the projects that different people at the university or other universities are involved with. And this is a Hollis pumpkin seed project. This is an ice cream that was made with the pumpkin seed oil. It's fantastic. Um, barley is another project I work with. I'll just touch on that very quickly. They had like three tables. There's so many things you can do with barley. We did tastings with bread, we did um, pasta, and then also mung chai, which is like a um, barley tea, tasting barley in different, a lot of different ways. This is Colin, who is now with Beijo Seeds. Um, this is back when he was a graduate student um, with um, at Washington State University with bread, different types of wheats that he was working on for bread. Here's the variety showcase in New York City. Um, really fantastic, very, you know, really well received there and got to feature a lot of different individuals that are doing this work on the East Coast. Um, there's quite a bit of impact it's making. Um, again, I'm going to go more quickly through these slides, but um, we've seen a rise from um, in Portland the first time we ever did this um, group, uh, this, this um, variety showcase. We had 100 individuals there. This last time we had 540 and that was sold out a couple of weeks beforehand, I think that probably we could have had like 700 people there, but it was just getting a little bit out of hand <laughs> as far as I was concerned with how many individuals would be there. But they've had, they've tasted so many different commercially available cultivars, so many breeding lines. Um, it's, it's been quite amazing to the impact that I've heard from um, breeders that this has had um, on their work and that they get so many uh, so much feedback and so many opinions in one evening than they will from the public than they will for the rest of the of the year. So um, it's been uh, it's really changed the trajectory of many of their work um, and they're pretty excited about it. And, and I'm, I'm glad that that's happening for them. So the other other ways that the Culinary Breeding Network works. is So that's just one um, event that I just put on each year and it's supported by typically ticket sales and uh, sponsorships. But I also um, work on different research projects to really create relationships with stakeholders and build community and then create these, um, uh, you know, and trying to create engaging events and activities that they can do to try to get the message of the research out to the public. Um, so Novik, you know about the winter squash I'll talk about. Um, the barley project, and then some things that are happening at the small farms program at, here at OSU. Um, so the Eat Winter Squash, again, I'm going to have to go through this quickly, but Eat Winter Squash was a project that started several years ago, and it continues whenever we can get funding um, for that work to do trials um, and try to identify varieties of squash that might be um, commercially viable. Um, a big problem that a lot of farmers have is um, storage issues. And so a lot of them rot in storage and so trying to find varieties that yield well, taste great, store well, and then also just can we can um, market them to, um, to the public, which is challenging. Um, we've come up with a, um, <laughs> um, and it's challenging because people don't want to, you know, they take a long time to cook. Um, because they're large and people are afraid to cut into them. Um, so we're trying to address all these things as well. We've come up with a, go to the this website, Eat Winter Squash, um, fantastic website, talks all about different types of squash, trying to get people excited about them and differentiating them. Right now, most consumers are eating butternut and some delicata here on the West Coast um, and trying to get them excited about squash that would be more profitable for our organic farmers. Um, Along with this, we have something called a sagra, which means festival in Italian. In Italian villages, oftentimes they have these celebrations um, around local produce and dishes um, in that area. So we have these really fun events. You can see in the top right-hand side, Tim Wastel is our partnering chef. Here he's doing a squash butchery. So showing people how to safely um, cut up squash, since that is, seems to be a big um, concern for people 
um, not wanting to cook squash. Um, so also that we have chefs that come to this and they make very um, home friendly recipes um, for people to taste and then they give away those recipes in hopes that people will cook winter squash at home. Uh, another sagra that we have, we just started doing last year, we just finished our, we had it the second time it happens in Seattle, is the Sagra de Radicchio. And Sagra, I mean, I'm sorry, Radicchio is a fantastic crop that we could be growing here in the Pacific Northwest and eating rather than lettuce. And a lot of people are starting to really embrace that, um, especially chefs. Um, and foodie types, but um, there are still a lot of individuals that don't really care for the bitterness in it. So we have this um, celebration. Um, the two individuals that are in the middle here, Jason and Siri, um, from Local Roots Farm up in near Seattle. And they sell, they grow a lot of radicchio and sell it to restaurants up in the Seattle area. And we're just trying to get people very excited about radicchio and um, educating them on different types of radicchio and how to prepare it so that people will start buying that in the winter time, um, hopefully rather than buying um, imported lettuce from other places. Uh, field days is a big part of our outreach, of course, and trying to get a lot of different types of people to our field days. So it's not just farmers and very, um, you know, like, uh, brew, like for barley, it would be brewers and distillers, but not just the people that are very close to the barley, but just making it um, more exciting um, so that we could get um, just average individuals um, in the public to come to our field day so that they can learn more about agriculture and supporting local farmers. So this was a field day that we had a couple of years ago where typically there'd only be about 20 people that would come and we got over 100 people to come. We had some bakers and some pasta makers and some ice cream makers there that do things with barley. So that always helps to have really fantastic food for people. Um, quickly go through this. Um, also trying to um, work with creating flavor wheels. This is a project um, or a, a process that we did at the at the bread up at the bread lab at WSU, where we had people taste different types of barley and try to um, explain um, with words what they tasted in different breeding lines and varieties. So these are this is a way where we actually gave some suggestions and they circled uh, words that they felt identified what they were um, that they're experiencing. We did this as well with winter squash, of course, because we love winter squash. And we're trying to differentiate the different types of squash so that people will think of them as different varieties and different uses. Um, and from that, we actually did create um, a flavor wheel. Um, this group of individuals that did, we did this with were trained chefs as well as uh, wine, wine makers and sommeliers and coffee roasters. Um, they were all really great at being able to identify flavors. Um, and this is something that's really exciting for a lot of farmers. They really like to have this and to um, be able to communicate with their customers um, more um, specifically and intelligently about flavor um, when they're trying to sell their stuff at market. A um, lot of different types of um, engagement that we're doing. Um, this is the Farming While Black. It was a book that came out from um, a farm in New York uh, and we had a panel to come together and talk with um, several of the leaders that are in the Pacific Northwest that are doing just really fantastic work. And, the, and one of the members of Soul Fire Farm here on the left, who uh, Amani is her name, who is one of the contributors to the book, came and talked about um, being African American and farming um, and the struggles uh, and challenges that uh, one has and how we can support and help um, to support our, our fellow um, African American, as well as we had a lot of Latinx farmers come um, also, that there's a quite a bit of um, disconnect between white and people of color in the farming community and trying to, to bridge that gap. Um, upcoming, um, and, and actually right now too, we have our Eat Winter Vegetables project. We just um, finished one year of that and getting into the event section that, um, of this um, project that I'll tell you about. So our, our vegetables that we focus on are winter squash, garlic, celeriac, cabbage, cauliflower, radicchio, Brussels sprouts, and purple sprouted broccoli. So there's a lot here in the Pacific Northwest for people to be consuming um, and purchasing locally. 
um, but it is a shorter list and a different list than in the height of the season. Um, so we're trying to get people very excited um, about earthly and bitter flavors um, and how to cook with these vegetables. So the outreach components are field days, the Sagra, the variety showcase. We also have a um, website if you want to check that out, eatwintervegetables.com. Um, I told you about the Variety Showcase of Oahu. I'm going to go through the upcoming events and then we'll, I can take questions. This is happening uh, next week, the second one we've done there. Really fantastic stuff happening, trying to encourage people to eat locally um, from the islands. Uh, this is that Eat Winter Vegetables project. We're having affiliate pantry and Sagra events. So it's a stock up market where farmers are selling um, winter veggies as well as grains and meats and such. Um, but we will, in our section, will be the Sagra, and people can come and taste um, different winter vegetables that, uh, and recipes that chefs have made, take recipes, just hopefully get very excited about um, eating locally in the wintertime. Jazz, this is a, um, a Sagra event um, that we're doing in Italy, actually. Um, I have a farming friend there that has been very inspired by seeing the work that we've been doing um, here in the United States, um, which is a funny thing because the Sagras are really based on what they, um, the celebrations they have in Italy, and, um, but apparently they um, aren't presented in the same manner, and so working with the Italians now to, to kind of have a, um, a Sagra like we would have here, which I think is just more in-depth information and trying to get people to, to get connected with their local farmers. Um, the variety showcase that's coming back here um, and that's going to focus on the winter vegetables will be on uh, February 16th. Um, there will be tickets available pretty soon on the website. Um, and just to let you know, there are quite a few other um, entities, organizations, and individuals that are trying to make these connections. Also, Seed to Kitchen Collaborative is uh, Julie Dawson out of University of Wisconsin at Madison. Kitchen Cultivars is up in the Northeast. The Bread Lab Collective is um, the Bread Lab at WSU in Washington. Um, Johnny Seeds, Row 7 Seeds, um, they're seed companies that are trying to work more with chefs um, and focus on flavor and um, organic breeding. And there's some, and Hannah is, Sea Garden is a, um, a graduate student at Cornell that is um, completely focused on trying to ha engage stakeholders in the breeding process to create uh, varieties that are more relevant to what the public wants. And the final slide here is please, um, you know, keep in touch with what we're doing. You can look at the website and then really Instagram, if you use social media, is a really fantastic way to see what's going on. It's not just what's going on with Culinary Breeding Network, but what's going on with plant breeders around the country and um, a lot of these other organizations that are trying to um, build these relationships and connections. And that is all I have for now. I know I talked for a long time, but we do have seven minutes. <laughs> so I can questions if you have any. Yes, thank you so much, Lane, for sharing your work with the Culinary Breeding Network. Very interesting stuff for sure. Um, open the floor up for questions. Feel free to pose those in the chat box. And we'll just take a little bit of time and uh, wait for those to roll in if you have any. Yeah. And another reason I have for, I mean, just keep type, type them in if you've got them. I'll just say also, like, I, I do hope that people get, look at these uh, events and are, get inspired by them and want to try to um, do those on their own where they are in the country, because it is something that I get a lot as uh, individuals saying, oh, hey, could you come over here and, and do this event or, you know, create, you know, come to North Carolina and do this. And it's, I know I have done one in Hawaii and one in, um, New York, but it's it is challenging to as one person to make all that happen. So, um, if anyone is interested in having that happen in your area, contact me. I can tell you how we could work together. Um, or, but I would also like to encourage others to try to, you know, do your own thing and just really try to um, make these connections um, and 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 create venues and events of your own to, to bring all these different individuals together because it's been pretty powerful what we've seen and bringing all these um, 
I mean, they're all very connected. It makes all the sense in the world that they would they would be convening together, but they just don't have that opportunity very often. Anything? I don't have any questions so far, Lane. Um, I would open up the floor, but it doesn't look like we have anyone calling in. So uh, in that case, they wouldn't be able to ask questions through the chat box thing. Um, so I think no questions then. Uh, we'll just go ahead and wrap up. Um, okay. I will do this little thing right here and take back the presenter. All right. Great. Uh, last couple things. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, ideas, or concerns about the webinar, feel free to reach out to me, wfullwider at ipminstitute.org. Look out for that follow-up email for the evaluation and the link to apply for CEUs if you're applying for them. Uh, with that, I thank you, Lane, so much for sharing your work with the Culinary Breeding Network. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. All right. Goodbye, everyone.